Take your Bible, if you will, and turn away to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. To begin with, I want to read the 16th verse, and then keep your Bible open, if you will, because we're going to go back and look through the entire chapter. But Romans, chapter 1. Look with me, if you will, verse 16. The Apostle Paul writing, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Salvation is the act of being saved. And Paul says the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to them, to everyone who believes. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time that we have together. Pray now in these next few moments that you would help us, bless us, direct us by your Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth. And help us, Lord, that we might be open to what the Spirit will say to the church in this hour. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. The Bible, if you will, go back to the beginning of chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. We talk about being saved around here all the time. I'd say at least six days a week, maybe seven, probably seven days a week, we're talking about being saved. Now, why is that? Well, let me reach way back in my life to give an illustration. I was uh, a new Christian and uh, hadn't been saved very long. I was dating a young lady who was a Methodist. And uh, I like Methodist, I do, but uh, she was a Methodist. And we dated for a while. And she said to me one day, she says, you know what I can't stand about you Baptists? Now, I haven't been a Baptist very long at all. Didn't know much about it. And she said, um, you know what I can't stand about you Baptists? I said, what's that? She says, every time you go to church, it's the same thing. You got to get saved. You got to get saved. You got to get saved. I said, you know why, don't you? She said, no, why? I said, because you got to get saved. That's why. <laughs> and that's exactly right. But why? Why do we need to be saved? That fact that we need to be saved ought to motivate us to ask some questions. <laughs> like what, for example? Like, be saved from what? Twice in my life, I got pulled out of water and saved from drowning. Uh, doubtless, had somebody else not come along and pulled me out, I probably wouldn't have made it. Two different times. And uh, you'd think you'd learn to swim, wouldn't you? But, uh, and I did. But the point is, you know, is that what we're talking about, being saved from drowning? I asked the little boy, I guess he was probably about nine years old one time, and I said, have you ever been saved? He said, yes. I said, how do you know? He said, I got hit by a car and I didn't die. <laughs> well, that is a sense of being saved, isn't it? It is. So is that what we're talking about? Being saved from drowning, being saved by from being hit by a car? What is it? Saved from what? Why do we need to be saved? And the next question is, why aren't we already just fine? Isn't everybody just fine, just the way we are? Well, I want us to take a look at the first chapter of the book of Romans. The book of Romans was written to the church at Rome before the Apostle Paul had ever gone to the city of Rome. Uh, there was already a church there. And... <clears throat> Paul writes this book, the whole book talks about being saved. In this book, we find the reasons why we need to be saved. We also find the way to be saved. That's very important. If you say, well, you need to be saved. You ought to be able to answer the question, well, how do I do that? It'd be terrible to tell me you need to be saved. And they say, well, how do I get saved? I don't know. Well, that's not much help at all, is it? So it tells us, why we need to be saved, it tells us the way to be saved, and then it gives us instructions on how to live after we have been saved. Now, we're not going to look at all that this morning, but some of it, but primarily I want us to consider this question, why do we need to be saved? If you're sitting there thinking, well, man, I'm already saved, I don't need to hear about that, why don't you tune in and see if there's something you can pick up on? First of all, let's go back to chapter 1 and read verses 1 to 4 begins this way, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto 
the gospel of God, not from the gospel of God, but unto the gospel of God, which he, God, had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, there's a great deal being said there. First of all, he talks about who he is. He talks, Paul, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. We won't go into all that that means. It means a great deal. He says he's separated unto the gospel. <clears throat> what does that mean? Separated from something. If you're separated, you're always separated from something. He's separated from something to the gospel. What he means here is God has separated him out, called him out to be a minister, a preacher of the gospel. Now that asks another question. What is the gospel? I mean, we talk about the gospel. We read about it in verse 16. We read about it here in verse 1. But what is the gospel? Well, this same writer, Paul, gives us a definition in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4 verses, where he says this. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. Well, that's good. That's what we wanted to know, isn't it? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. He says, which I preached unto you, and by which also you are saved. Now, there's a strong clue right there. We are saved by the gospel. Still haven't told us what it is. So let's begin again. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, by which also you're saved, and wherein you stand, you stand strong, you're firm there, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. What does that mean? Unless it's not true? Well, is it true or not? Yes, it's true, but listen. We still haven't learned what the gospel is. We learned about it, but what is it? He said, for I did delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. What does he say? What I received, I have given to you. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Take what is given to us and give it to others. I declare unto you the gospel, which I also received. And he said, this is it. How did Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What do you mean according to the scriptures? According to what the scripture said would happen. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Very simple, but very profound. So Jesus Christ died on the cross. You know that. The reason Jesus died on the cross is because you and I have sinned and as we have sinned, that sin needs to be paid for and we can either pay for it ourselves, and the price is extremely high. We'll show you that in a little bit. Or we can pay for it ourselves, or we can have it paid for on our behalf. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Pay for our sins on our behalf. Paid our debt for us. Now, he goes on to say he was buried and he rose again the third day. That is essential part of the gospel. If Jesus died and paid for our sins, that would be wonderful. But how do we know? How do we know that he did that? How do we know that's true? Well, you know that because of the resurrection from the dead. And that is the confirming factor of all of the gospel. Jesus did not stay dead. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 1.18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. So who can open and close hell and death? Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the one who's living and yet was dead. Now, that brings us to another key statement. In verse 3 it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, he was physically a descendant of King David, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Again, the resurrection confirms, proves, and changes everything. And then in verse 5, Paul introduces a new word to us. By whom we have received grace 
and apostleship. Apostleship means that he was sent out as a special messenger of Jesus Christ. But what is this grace? Well, again, the same writer, Paul, gives us a definition of that in the third chapter of the book of Titus. He says, grace is the love and kindness of God our Savior toward man. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Grace is the love and kindness of God our Savior toward man. So if that's the definition, can we go back and read the verse that way? Verse 5, by whom, by Jesus Christ, we have received the love and kindness of God our Savior toward man and apostleship. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? For obedience to the faith among all nations. Now there's another word, faith. Faith. What is faith? Uh, in the New Testament, the word faith is always a translation of the Greek word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S in English. And that is what? It is a belief that is guaranteed. It is not baseless, but it's because of evidence presented or discovered. In other words, you're having faith, but you're not just having faith in nothing. You're not having faith in emptiness. You're having faith in reality. I was talking to the campers the other day about reality and the difference between something that's mythological and something that's real. And we talked about that quite a bit. And I told them how that we don't fight against mythology. Why? Because it's not real. It's not there. You don't fight against imagination. Why? Because there's nothing to fight against. You fight against something that's real, or you fight for something that's real. And we need to understand what's real and what isn't. And certain things are real, they're solid, they're reality. The fact that you are sitting in this room right now, that's a reality. You don't, you're not somewhere else imagining that you're sitting here. You are here. You're not a, a picture in a magazine, you're not an image on a video screen, you're a reality. And so we have to understand there are certain things that are real. Why do you bring that up? Because there's a, a trend in our day to reject things that are real and start to call them by names that are meaningless and change the meaning of words and say, well, this word means this. No, it doesn't mean that means something else. Listen, if a word doesn't mean what it means, then it becomes meaningless. If faith does not mean a belief that is guaranteed, if it does not mean a belief that is not baseless, but based upon evidence presented or discovered, if it doesn't mean that, then what does it mean? Well, it means I, I trust in something. Well, what? Well, I don't know. That's pretty empty, isn't it? So our faith is not empty. It is not baseless. And then Paul writes in verse 6, among whom you are called, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed verse 5, my bad. He said, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. So this message is for all nations, for his name, for the name of Jesus Christ. Among whom ye are ye also the call of Jesus Christ. Then Paul says he's writing to all that be in Rome. Beloved of God, called to be saints. Well, I know about the saints in Rome. There are those people who have been canonized by the church. That's not what the word means here. What it means is somebody who has been cleansed and set apart or separated for God's service. Now, who could that be? That could be you. That could be you. How are you cleansed? Well, the choir sang about it this morning. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You can be cleansed and you can be set apart for God's service. How are you? And then he says this. He says in verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Everybody, everywhere Paul had been had heard about the believers that were in Rome. To whom he wished grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 9 he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. What he's saying there is I'm praying for you all the time. What's he praying about? 
Verse 10, make your request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come on you. That's how we know that Paul was writing this before he had come to that church there. He is writing saying, I want by God's will to come. I want to come and visit you. I want to be at the church there. In verse 11, he says, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. In other words, he wants to get together with the people there. He wants to teach them more about the gospel, more about the Lord, and he wants to enjoy together their faith. That's largely what we're doing here today. But he longed for the opportunity to go to Rome because he wanted to preach and teach to the people who were there. Verse 13 says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that sometimes I purposed to come unto you, but was left or hindered hitherto, I was stopped from coming, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He's saying, I want to come to Rome, I want to preach, I want to minister, I want to share the gospel with the people at Rome. I want to encourage you in the faith. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Now, the Greeks, obviously the people of Greek, but the Greeks are often used as, in the New Testament to refer to Gentiles. But he says to the barbarians, those who would have lived north of Rome, up in what we would now call France and, and Germany and up in that area, barbarians, they were called, to the wise, the Greeks always thought they were wise, and to the unwise. Verse 15, so much as in me is, Paul says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now wait a minute. There were already believers in Rome. There was already a church in Rome. Paul said that. He wanted to go there. How come? He wants to now go there and preach to these people. Well, number one, just because there was a church there didn't mean everybody in Rome was saved. Matter of fact, the truth is, the majority of people in Rome would not have been saved. Now, I'm going to say something here. I'm not meaning this as an insult to anybody. Please understand that. Here we are in this room today. And it's a fairly safe assumption that most of the people in this room, if not everyone, most people in this room have been saved. However, we are here in a city, in a county, in a state, and in a country. Is it reasonable to assume that most of the people in the city are saved? No. Most people in the county are saved? No. Most people in the state are saved? No. Most people in the country are saved? No. That's not reasonable. So, even though you have a group of people, such as were in Rome, who have been born again, who are believers in Jesus Christ, who have been saved, it is not reasonable to assume that there are not other people there who need to be saved. We're talking about why do we need to be saved. Verse 16, a very precious verse to me. We read it to start off with. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says in verse 15, I'm ready to come preach at Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, why would he see you be ashamed? Because there are a lot of people who persecuted not only the gospel message, but those who preached it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. Let me share with you something else here. That word power in English is a translation of the Greek word dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite. That's the kind of power, that's the kind of energy that he's talking about here. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is that which saves us. That's why he wrote 1 Corinthians 15. I quoted it to you a while ago. I, the clarity of the gospel which I have preached unto you, by which also you are saved. You're saved by believing the gospel. What is the gospel? How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That is the gospel. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the dynamite of God unto salvation to who? To everyone that believes. He says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Two preachers, great preachers that I knew years ago, one of them had a daily radio broadcast, and uh, his 
broadcast would come on the air and without any uh, musical introduction or any of that, and he would just come on the air and he'd say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also in the Greek. It started out that way every day. And he called the broadcast gospel dynamite. Where to get that? Because the word translated power in that verse is the same word from which we get our English word dynamite. That was one preacher. Another preacher was Dr. Jacob Gartenhouse. I've mentioned him here many times. And he was the son of a rabbi, and he grew up in Austria. And just before the Holocaust began, he and his brother moved to New York. In New York, Jacob Gartenhouse found the gospel. Or he would say the gospel found him. And he became a mighty preacher for Jesus Christ. And often he would stand and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first, he would say, and also to the Greek. Well, why did he say it that way? To the Jew first. Well, number one, he was Jewish. But was he right in that? Sure he's right, because that's exactly what it says. Well, what does it mean to the Jew first? Well, the first people on the planet Earth who received the gospel were the Jewish people. So did the gospel really come to the Jew first? It did. And then also to the Greek. And again, the Greek here means the Greek people specifically, but also applies to everyone else who is a Gentile. We read that word in this chapter, which means anybody who is not Jewish. So what is he saying? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, regardless of what you're heritage is, what language group you're from, what your nationality is, none of that changes that the gospel is for you and that you can believe and be saved. It's pretty clear. Then, in verse 17, he says, for there in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, that's a very important statement also. The just. The just means those who have justified, been justified, those who have been made righteous, those who have been saved. Saved from what? The penalty of sin. We're going to take a look at that in just a moment. But the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Hundreds of years ago, better than 500 years ago now, uh, in Germany, there was a priest who was studying the Bible. And as he studied the Bible, he became more and more convicted of his own sin. And he did all kinds of things to try to atone for his own sin. He would flagellate himself. What does that mean? It means he'd take a whip and whip his own back. Why? To atone for his own sin. And then he would crawl up the steps to the cathedral on his knees, praying, stopping and praying on each step to atone for his sin. But he could never find peace of heart and peace of mind. He did all the religious activities he was supposed to do. He took the sacraments of the church. He did everything he was supposed to do but he could not find peace of mind and peace of heart. And then he began to study the book of Romans. He didn't get too far in, he's in this first chapter, and he came to this verse. He came to verse 17, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. That's what he wanted, he wanted to be right with God. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, the righteous, the saved, those whose sins are forgiven shall live by faith. And he said, that's it. That's it. That's it right there. It's not all the ritual I've been going through. It's not the self-punishment I've been going through. It is faith. And he realized that what he really needed above all else, was to put his faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. 
That man was Martin Luther, who became the founder of the Lutheran Church. Verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now let's talk about that for a moment. The wrath of God. The wrath is anger, but it's not just anger. It's a very hot anger. And it causes us to think of the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 37 to 39. You don't need to turn there. Let me just read it to you. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not, the people knew not, until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, this is what Jesus is saying before he comes again, and comes again in judgment. Before that occurs, things are going to be like they were in Noah's day. Well, what was that like? People eating and drinking, marrying, getting married. In other words, life is just going on as usual. And the people of Noah's day didn't realize till the flood came and took them away what was happening. He says, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what was it like in Noah's day? Why did that flood come? Listen to me carefully. This is Genesis 6, 5 through 8. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. But the next statement's even stronger. He says that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mankind had gotten into such a state that all they thought about was evil and how to do it. It says in the next verse that it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And you think, wow, that's, that's terrible. And it is. Listen to the very next statement. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was a man who found grace. What does it mean? Grace, he found the love and kindness of God our Savior toward me. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that by faith, Noah entered into the ark. So what saved Noah? Well, the ark, he got in it, he didn't drown in the flood. Well, that's very true. But what saved Noah was his faith. So the wrath of God, it says, and is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, that's another important statement. Men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What does that mean? It means those who know the truth. They know what the truth is. But they refuse the truth. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you that there have been times in the history of the earth, there have been times in the history of mankind when every human being on the planet knew about God. I did not say that every human being knew God. There's a difference. But every human being knew about God. Well, what were those times? Well, evidently before the flood. So they knew the truth, they knew there was God, they knew about God, but they rejected God. And they went their own way. And they went away from God. They said, we don't need God in our life. We can make it on our own. And it got to a, a digression, a descent into wickedness and evil. And so the flood came as a judgment. But did everybody die in the flood? No, those who came to God by faith were saved. Well, how many people was that? Eight? How many people were in the world at that time? I don't know. We're not told. It was thousands of years ago. Don't know how many people were in the world then. But you can be sure it was a great many more than eight. I told somebody the other day, and I, I've told this often, I said, Back years ago when I coached high school basketball, we ended up third place in our conference. 
And then I always have to tell them, yes, there were more than three teams in the conference. But it's easy to be third place if there's only three, three teams, right? Mm -hmm. So there were more than three teams in the conference. And so, yes, we got to be third place. Now, here's what we're saying. How many people in the world? I don't know. Great many more than eight, to be sure. And yet eight people were saved. Why? Because eight people believed the truth. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 3, verse 18. He said, he that believeth on him, the Lord Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, not because he didn't know, but because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Somebody who knows the truth, but refuses the truth. So how do we know that that's what Paul is saying here? Look at verse 18 again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They know the truth. They not only hold it, they keep it to themselves. They won't share it with anybody else. They don't believe. They don't trust in the Lord. They don't allow anybody else to either. Have you noticed something in recent years? This isn't new. It's not something that just started in 2019. It's been going on for a good while now. You can talk publicly about just, just almost any subject you want to. If you'd like to go out here and, and hire a city building and hold a session to teach people about transcendental meditation, that's fine. You can do that. No, no problem. If you'd like to go out here and, and public and uh, maybe address students at school and teach them about Islam, yes, you can do that. If you'd like to go somewhere and teach some people about Someplace in a public forum and teach about Buddhism, sure, no, no issue. Go right ahead. But if you want to go and tell people about Jesus Christ, oh no, 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 no. We have separation of church and state. How does that work with all these other things? Does it? Does it? You see, it's only Jesus Christ. It's only the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That is, it, that is excluded. Nobody else is excluded. Want to teach people about Krishna? Who's Krishna? You ever seen those statues with the, the eight arms that come out like that? Yeah. Krishna is the eight armed God of reincarnation. You want to teach people about Krishna? Yeah, go ahead. Fine. Have at it. Want some TV time? We'll give it to you. No, I haven't done that yet. Now, here's what I'm trying to get across to you. Those who hold the truth, they know what the truth is. They not only don't trust in the Lord themselves, they keep the truth away from others. Well, how do you know that? Because of verse 19 and following. He says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest, made visible in them. Why? For God hath showed it unto them. How did God show it to them? Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, the invisible things about God. There are things about God that you and I have not seen. They are invisible to us here in the time and space in which we live. They are invisible. But the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What, how can you see that which is invisible? How can you see something that isn't visible? Here it is. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood. How? By the things that are made. You understand the things you can't see because of the things that you can see. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they did know. Who knew? People in ancient times knew God. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I said people before the flood, all of them knew about God. They didn't all know God, they knew about God. What about after the flood? You know what? Everybody in the world knew about God. How do you say that? Because there was Noah and his family, and they all knew about God, and everybody else descended from them, and they knew about God. Well, I'd like to see some historical evidence of that. I'll share some with you. 
I've mentioned this here many times. I can document what I'm about to tell you. I'm not going to this morning for time's sake, but I can. I got a great deal of this from two books. One of them was titled The Discovery of Genesis in the Chinese Language. If you go back into the ancient characters of the Chinese language, China, one of the oldest civilizations on the planet, you're going to find that the language is a pictorial language. In other words, instead of spelling words out, they act in picture words. It's not the only language that does that. Ancient Egyptian was the same. But in the Chinese pictorial language, the symbol for sin is a man and a woman under a tree. Why is that the symbol for sin? Why is it anybody under a tree to begin with? And if it is anybody under a tree, why is it a man and a woman? Could that have to do with Adam and Eve under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Could, couldn't it? Let's go beyond that. You know what the symbol for flood is? Eight people in a boat. Now, it's reasonable the symbol for flood would have a boat in it. You, that, that makes sense. People trying to escape. Well, why is it eight people? Why is it one people or two people or three or five or ten or twelve? But it isn't. It's eight. Eight people in a boat. How many people were on Noah's Ark? Eight. It goes on and on and on. And the ancient Chinese were monotheists. What is that? It means they believed in one God. They called that God Shanti. Shanti means the heavenly emperor. And if you follow the way, if you look into how they worship Shanti, you're going to find it's very much the same way the Hebrews worship their one God. What are you saying? I'm saying, here's Noah and his family in the Middle East, and here's the Chinese folk way over in the East, and they're worshiping, all worshiping one God in the same way, and they're telling the same stories about Adam and Eve and Noah and the flood and all that. How'd they get all that? Because they all descended from the same family, and it's all, every nation on earth at one time knew about God. So what happened? Well, we're going to see what happened. Take a look, if you will, at verse 21 again. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain or empty in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. The farther we get away from God, the farther we get away from life, the farther we get away from life, the more darkness is upon our heart, the more darkness we live in, and the darker things are, the less we are able to see. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I'm going to tell you, generally speaking, there are exceptions to this, of course. But generally speaking, people in 21st century world, worldwide, and America in particular, but not just in America, worldwide, we think we are the smartest, most advanced people who have ever lived. I don't want to insult anybody, but we're probably not. How can you say that? Because if you'll go back and, and look at archaeology, you're going to find people that thousands of years ago who did things, built things, that not only are still standing, in some cases are still in use thousands of years later, but in some cases, people today with all our intelligence and all our technology can't figure out how they did it. What are you saying? That we're stupid today? No, I'm not saying we're stupid today. I'm saying that we're not smarter than our ancestors. They were equally as intelligent as we are. See, we bought the lie that we all came from a bunch of apes, and those apes turned into men that walked around, dragged their knuckles, and carried clubs, and whacked each other, and lived in came. Not true. Not true. People have always been people. Do you know who, you know who believed that some people had evolved higher than other people, and honestly believed and I've read this in his own words, believed that by eliminating those people groups who have not evolved as highly as others, you can speed up evolution and make people get better and better and better. You know who believed that? Adolf Hitler. That was his whole promise, premise. That's what he was all about. Now, you can go Hitler's path or you can go God's path. I choose to go God's way. 
So what did they do? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, they changed the glory of God, the glory of the uncorruptible God, into an image made like to corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. In other words, they replaced God with idols. And those idols look like people, or they look like birds, or they look like animals, or they look like creeping things. We can creep things like bugs and things. Oh, nobody's ever worshipped bugs. Oh, yes, they have. Yes, they have. Verse 24. Wherefore, because of all this, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Why did he do that? Because these were people who, verse 25, changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What creature did they worship? Man and animals and birds and creeping things. Those things which cannot do anything for us. So, verse 26, for this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly. Unseemly means that which doesn't even seem like people would do. And receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was me. And even as they, watch this, as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You know what they're saying? What it's saying here is people chose to reject God out of their knowledge. They chose to either say there is no God, or maybe they don't say it, but they live like there's no God. They live for today. There is no eternity. There is no tomorrow. What matters is that I am satisfied and pleased right now. Is that not a picture of where we are today in society? Again, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, cannot be satisfied, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them, who turn it into entertainment. Now, there's lots of illustrations of that last part we could give people who do wickedness and turn it into entertainment. But let me just be real blunt. The strongest, most obvious evidence I could give you that is pornography. People who do wickedness and then enjoy watching other people. Now, that's not the only example of that we could give, but I think it gets the point across. No. It said back earlier, Paul said the things, the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the evidence in his writings. Blaise Pascal was a French scientist and philosopher. He said this, he said, inside every human being is a God-shaped vacuum that only God can do. That's what Martin Luther was looking for. And what he found when he came to faith. Isaac Newton said this. Isaac Newton went out of his garden one evening and he looked up in the sky and he saw the moon. Isaac Newton, one of the great scientists of all time, and he said the moon always stays right there. Doesn't crash into the earth, doesn't go flying off into space, stays right there, been there thousands of years. He looked at the sun the next day and he said the earth is about the same distance from the sun as long as mankind has recorded history and we haven't gotten too close and burned up, we haven't gotten too far away and frozen. We stay right there. And we know he wrote that century ago, and it's still true. Isaac Newton said, there is something that keeps everything in the universe in order. And more and more scientists, I don't say all of them, but more and more scientists are coming to that same conclusion that Newton did. 
that there's order in the universe and it cannot be coincidental or accidental. Many years ago, my family and I were in New Mexico. We visited the Carlsbad Caverns. Maybe you've heard of that. They are caves very high up in a mountain. And they, they're they known for being the home of, of bats. And I didn't see Batman there, but we saw lots of bats in the cave. And these caves, it's quite obvious if you look at it, were formed by erosion. What does that mean? That means the mountains of New Mexico, now think about where New Mexico is, think where the nearest large body of water would be, the Pacific or the Gulf of Mexico or any of that, pretty far away. But the mountains of New Mexico were at one point underwater. And as the water receded, it eroded out these caverns. Now you can find evidence of that not only all over the western U.S., you find evidence of that all over the planet. For example, whale skeletons have been found in, in the interior of Central America. Whale skeletons have been found in the Saudi Arabian desert. You gotta ask yourself, how did whales get there? Well, evidently, that was at one time underwater. The most logical conclusion is the whales swam there. Well, the Carlsbad caverns were hollowed out by erosion. So as the water receded, it eroded out these caves, and they're, they're massive caves, and you can go in there. It is a national park, and you can go in there, and there are, are uh, U.S. park rangers there to give you a guided tour. Now, back these caverns weren't explored until the late 1940s. Important to know that. In the caverns today, they have paved trails that you're to walk on. And you're not to touch the stalactites or stalagmites in the cave because you'll damage them if you do. And there are uh, these trails that you must stay on. You can't get off the trail. And if this was, there, there are on the trails concrete curves. And the curves are probably about six inches or so, maybe six or eight inches high. And they go all along the curve, or all along the curves, go all along the trail so you don't step off the trail. Makes sense, right? Growing on top of those curves, we saw, and this was 30 years or so ago, we saw stalagmites growing up on the curve. Now, while we're getting the tour, they told us that it takes thousands of years for stalagmites to form. And as we were leaving, I said, now, I asked one of the park rangers, I said, those curves were put in in the late 1940s. He said, right. I said, so they're at the point that we were there. I said, they're not more than 50 years old. He said, right. I said, but I thought it took thousands of years for stalagmites to form. He said, they're right. I said, now how can they be growing on top of concrete that's only 50 years old? You know what this U.S. Park Ranger said? After everything else he said, he said, it tells you something about how old they are, they are, doesn't it? In other words, it doesn't take thousands of years for these things to fall. Let me tell you something else. Not too long before that, my family and I were out in Washington State, been out there a couple of times, and we were on an airplane. This wasn't too long after the Mount St. Helens eruption. We went up to the foot of Mount St. Helens. At that point, you weren't allowed to go up on the mountain. I don't know if you are today, maybe so. And when we were there, it was too soon after. You could not go up on the mountain. We went to the foot of Mount St. Helens, and later, we were in an airplane flying right by. And the pilot said, you look out the right side of the aircraft, and you can see the crater that was created when Mount St. Helens erupted. Now, some of you who are old enough to remember when that happened, remember the dust and ash from Mount St. Helens in Washington State went as far east as New Jersey. And things happened there on Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Geological changes happened that scientists previously believed took thousands of years to happen. And they happened at the eruption of Mount St. Helens in minutes. Not thousand years, not hundreds of years, not decades of years, not years, not weeks, minutes. That's how powerful that eruption was. Oh, and you know the earthquakes we've been having lately, they've changed things geologically tremendously, 
And guess what? I also read the other day, I don't know much about it, just, just read a brief headline about it, but uh, there's a volcano in, uh, where was it? I think Yellowstone Park, that uh, during these earthquakes, the magma pushed up a mile and a half. You think more is going to happen? Yeah, I do. What's going to I don't know, folks. I don't know any more than you do. I'll wait and see. What I'm saying is there's evidence that the things that are understood, the things that we can see, help us understand the things that we don't know and help us understand the things that we can't see. This downward progression of the human race when they knew God, mankind in general, they glorified him not as God. They were not thankful. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And so we get to this point. If your Bible still open, look at Romans chapter 3. Just, just, if your Bible like mine, you just have to look across the page to get to chapter 3. Come to verse 21, if you would. For the same writer writes, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, not by keeping the law. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the writers, and that's a reference to the Old Testament, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Same thing said in chapter 1. The righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ, Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Why do we need to be saved? Here's why. Verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now we read a list of sins in chapter 1 there. And maybe you can sit there and safely say, I'm not guilty of any of those things. And I would believe you if you told me that. Wouldn't question it for 10 seconds. But does that mean... That you are totally without sin? No. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's plain and simple. We've all done something that violates the righteousness of God. <clears throat> but in verse 24, we can be justified freely by His grace through faith. Uh, I'm sorry, be justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, which comes by faith now. Turn over, if you will, chapter 6, and we're finished. Chapter 6, and get down to the last verse of the chapter. Why do we need to be saved? Here it is. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through the church. Not through doing good works. Not through keeping religious rituals, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Why do we need to be saved? Because we have all sinned, and the wages of sin is death. What are we going to be saved from? The wages of sin. Who's going to save us? Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we've had this time together. Lord, it is my prayer that you touch each heart here this morning. Help each of us to know that you love us, that you paid for our sins at the cross, that you're alive today, ready and willing to forgive all who will come to you by faith. Lord, it may be that everybody in this room has already trusted you as their Savior. And if that is true, Lord, I thank you and praise you. Lord, if there's even one person here you would say, you know, I've not done the things listed in Romans chapter 1. But I know, and if I'm honest with God, I have to admit, I have done some things in my life I know I shouldn't have done, some things I know were wrong. I have done some things that I know would displease God. So I understand also that I'm a sinner. But that doesn't change the fact that God still loves us. That doesn't change the fact that Jesus paid for our sins at the cross. That doesn't change the fact that if you come to him by faith, you can be saved. Romans 10, 17 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
calm trust in the Savior to write. Heads bowed, eyes are closed. Just a moment, we're going to say amen to this prayer. And then we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you're here this morning, you're not 100% certain that if you were to die today, that heaven would be your eternal home because your sins are forgiven and Jesus is your Savior. I invite you to come and let us help you with that. We'll be so happy to help you with that. If you're here today, and you say, well, preacher, that's not me. But God is speaking to me about something else. This is your opportunity to respond. Let the Lord have his will and his way in your life. You come when we say, don't wait, don't hesitate, don't worry about what somebody else is doing, what somebody else thinks. You just do what God's telling you to do. And you come. Father, bless and move this invitation time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.